Here. Tom Hagland. Here. Sue Kern. Here. Ruth Nelson. Here. Bob Nystrom. Here. Chris Robinson. Here. All present. Okay, we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance <laughs> to the flag of the, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And next up, we have approval of the agenda as amended. There was one addition made to the consent calendar today, and I don't know if you noticed it or not, but it was an addition of a, a part-time music assistant at the high school. And um, Andrea Russ could come up and explain that if you would like. Why don't, why don't you come up and explain it, just real quick. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, as all of you know that we do um, annual field trips, our, our music ensembles, along with our world language uh, groups, are very fortunate to be supported in that. And it um, includes a vast fundraising uh, by the participants and by the directors and the teachers involved. And uh, many years ago, I learned this in history that we had a um, music manager, a music fund manager that was paid by the district uh, to work part-time to manage all the accounts that went along with these trips. And, uh, prior to my tenure here, they actually traveled overseas, and so um, the costs were quite, quite high. And so um, for many years, we've tried to operate using our resources at the high school. The person who had done the position retired. Uh, she had done it for a number of years, and she was well-connected to the group. And so she retired, and we did not hire for that position uh, at that time. Um, it was uh, shortly after I began, mm -hmm. and we had some reductions to, to work with. And so we have operated using our resources, but with um, limited clerical resources, and we have a payroll cashier, clerk cashier at the high school, uh, who is also now helping with student activities. Uh, we got together to brainstorm with our music directors to, to, to figure out maybe how could we have some of these responsibilities um, move to somebody else's plate. And so we brainstormed and one thing that came out in our meeting is that every year we fundraise and we put our fund, some of our fundraising dollars into what we call a community collection, meaning that local businesses sell coupon, those coupon books, music books, and they put it into a community uh, collection and that money is used uh, at the discretion of the directors to maybe help offset the cost of a student that need, and um, they keep it for any surprise expenses that may come up so it doesn't come at the end prior to a trip. So we sat and calculated the job responsibilities for what we would call a fundraising music manager and how many hours we think it would be. The peak season is September, October, and November. And then we uh, consulted with Jenny Castle, our um, director of human resources, to talk to her, would this be feasible if we offset uh, this position by using the community fundraising dollars? And she supported that. And, and the music directors indicated for the last number of years they have not used that fund, fund um, very much because the students had done such a great job with their fundraising on their own. And they, they plan years out. They don't plan just one year out. They, they usually plan two to three years out for these, on, uh, these trips. So I'm here today asking if you would support us posting for a part-time position. This would be a one-year position to see how it goes. And we would use the money not from the school district, but from the fundraising community dollars to pay for a person to do this part-time and manage it. Also to note, um, in years past, they used to have literally a notebook where they'd write down all the fundraising dollars that came in, and they'd try to organize it through uh, paper and pencil. Um, there are actually a number of great online application programs to help manage these types of tasks, and we would like to have somebody learn that and help us be more efficient in our fundraising model at the high school. Okay. Mm -hmm. So no impact to the general fund. Pardon me? No impact to the general no fund. No impact to the general fund. Okay. Or directly to the student fundraised dollars. They all go into their own account. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Are we, are we, we don't. It's part of. It's going to come up later in the. Well, it's part of the um, 
approval of consent calendar. Consent calendar. So if you want to pull it out and discuss it separately, you can. Perfect. Okay. I so move to approve the agenda as presented with the additional uh, part time okay. person. Okay. Second. Thank you. So a first from Director Campbell, a second from Director Nystrom. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Next up we have our um, public comment period. Um, if, you're, if you would like to address the board, um, we welcome your comments. Be reminded that you must comply with board policy two, 206 and the following um, rules apply. The school board will enforce a three minute limit on each person talking. During the public comment session, complaints or allegations against students or employees may not be discussed due to data privacy. They should be submitted instead to, in writing to Superintendent Larson. And there'll be no verbal interaction or question and answer with the Board of Education or the Superintendent of Schools. So with that, if anyone would like to speak, come up and state your name and you may speak. Big crowd out there, but no one to speak. Okay, wonderful, we'll move on then. Um, next up is approval of minutes from the regular school board meeting July 16th. I would so move to approve the minutes for the regular school board meeting for July 16th. Second. Thank you. First from Director Kern, a second from Director Hagelin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, next we have the consent calendar. Um, do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I guess I'd like to pull the topic that was added by amendment for okay. discussion. Okay. So we'll pull the music assistant. We'll vote on everything except for that. Okay. So do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar without that music position? Thank you, Director Campbell. Second. Thank you, Director Robinson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And next up, we'll discuss the music position. So I guess the item of clarification that I would like on that is whether this pertains strictly to music program fundraising or whether we are going to now involve that individual in fund the other fundraising that goes on uh, during the school year. Um, Mrs. Rusk mentioned the um, travels that occur in the language program. and Certainly there are other fundraising mm -hmm. activities going on. Okay. Given the source of funds, I, I think we ought to clarify that before okay. we approve it. And Ms. Rusk will come up and Robinson, I apologize. I probably should have been more inclusive. We are open to that. I think that's what we would like to see happen to have us include that. But at this time, World Language um, has a very tight, um, they, they do an excellent job in, in organizing their fundraising dollars. Uh, and they do it on their own through volunteers. Um, but we, I think, would like to, because of the numbers of the, that are involved in music, uh, we felt like we needed to address this first and then invite them to be part of it. But I think it could actually, um, the fundraising done by American Sign Language and Spanish are many times done off campus through fundraising efforts. One of the things that has done for many, many years in, the, in our high school with the music ensembles has been the coupon book, which is through directly through a company and there's a lot of cash that's exchanged with the value of those dollars. So we're open to including more groups because we think it's a pretty good model, but um, with this particular request, music had already built in this community <coughs> fund and it, there was a past practice of having somebody do that. So um, we just had to dig around a little bit and find more about the position and what the job responsibilities were. There are still a lot of volunteers, both in music and in world language, where they 
volunteer time to go out and do fundraising. That's not going to change. It's really more the accounting and the cash collecting and um, making sure the records are accurate with the students dropping off coupon books, checking them out, and then the large amounts of cash. And this fund that we're taking it from is different from Music Matters, right? It's not Correct. Not at all. No. Okay. Completely okay. separate. But it's directed for music or it's directed? It's, the fund is actually, um, so when businesses in town want to support the music, they will take 20 or 30 or 50 coupon books to sell in their business. They're very popular. We sell out every year. Yeah. Okay. So they sell them, and that's not directly tied to a student. It's tied to we just put it into a community fundraising okay. fund. And that's where we approximately have about $3,000 or $3, a year that sits in that fund. Okay. Um, and then they allocate that out as needed. They just noticed that in the last few years, um, I'm not sure why, they didn't know either, but there hasn't been as great of a need okay. by students. They've been doing the fundraising on their own. Okay. So it really is, pertains to music. It, it is. It's, it's yeah. through a music fundraiser that is really mass and scale, as opposed to a lot of smaller fundraising efforts that other groups do throughout the year. Okay. Does that help? It does. Thank I you. Think there, and I think there are some funds left in music, which Music Matters did. Yeah. Right. There, There is still a balance in the Music Matters Fund, yeah. which is separate from yeah. what, we, what we oversee at the high school. So I'm just seeing this for the first time and seeing the numbers. So is it the music books that generates the $3,000? It is. And the total sales, kids, and these stores? No. No, that's just the it's stores. The stores. And, and so the stores are selling them. They're collecting $3,000. Well, we're gonna that's what the profit is. Okay. And then what it's going to cost is 2000 we built in just an extra cushion of $1,000 so that if anything came up in needs regards to the trip coming up, um, we, we don't have a real clear bar uh, barometer of how many hours it'll take this year to manage. So we sat and calculated with our clerk cashier how many hours a week does she spend working on this. But she's integrated into her work day. But I guess what I'm asking is through this effort, do we receive $3,000 in in, in funds and it's going to cost us two thousand mm -hmm. out of that. Right. So we're going to net a thousand. Right. That we will have a discretionary, you know, decision making for if something comes up as a one year the transportation cost from here to the airport was higher than they projected, so they use that community fund to offset that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not real keen on it seems like a pretty low return, and in particular, at least as a purchaser or seller of the books over the years, thinking that the funds are going to the kids versus now we're hiring someone to, to manage that. So I always am leery about nonprofits, and we're spending a lot of money to manage. So mm -hmm. I, it just the numbers, it doesn't make sense to me, unless I'm seeing this wrong. As a point of clarification, the way it sounds is, is we're, we're proposing to spend that amount amount of money for a part-time employee to manage thousands and thousands of dollars that are raised by the kids currently being done by a staff person who already is short of time in the day right we're, but we're where does the three what's the three thousand so that those funds come in from books that are sold independently of the students for their own account If so there's a what's the total dollar amount that's raised in selling the books? And this person's going to manage that then, all of it? Well, they're gonna they're gonna manage the accounting for the collection, the the distribution of the books, because we sell thousands of books, and then they come back in, the ones that are unsold, and then the ones that are sold it comes in and then they have to manage whose account does it go into, the profit. And then we turn around and pay the company that 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 um, solicits the ads and the, or the the coupon business from the local merchants, and then uh, that's where the profit is. Is a, we negotiate each year what the profit will be between the actual cost of the book and what we pay them, and the businesses will sell them at the same face value, twenty five dollars, and then they turn in the book. They turn in the money mm -hmm. to our <coughs> cashier. So is the funding understated, the 3000 then? Help me on this one. 
Well, as I understand it, that is funding that's independent of any individual student. So it's like there's... It's a net gain of... So what's the total revenue generated from this funding activity then? It's 3000 uh, plus? We raise $50,000 for that. Oh, I would trip. say in excess of $50,000 we raise and the student, um, the for the students. And it's allocated across <coughs> between 70 and 100 students' accounts. And because they can participate multiple years, they could maybe start in 10th grade and sell coupon books, and then it stays in their account. Mm -hmm. And it follows them until they take the trip, and then that money is allocated to their, to their trip expense. And, and and they would also manage if they do like a cub foods yes. bagging. Yes. That would be part of this. Right. We, they have a few smaller fundraising activities, but this is a very large in magnitude fundraising. And it, we see this as really wonderful opportunity for our students. However, the management is quite great with the students. So it's just understated the 3,000 in what's what I'm reading then. Right. That's a, I would say, undedicated profit that we have just sitting there. It's not allocated to any one student. Mm -hmm. It's just through the business They're going to manage everything, all the students' accounts. They're going to manage every student's account from Over 9th through 10th, years. 12th grade, band and choir, and uh, orchestra may join it one of these years, and I apologize if I was unclear in that. No, no, I just, I was doing the simple math, I didn't have to. <laughs> no, so that's just a small fraction of the overall okay, fundraising you. revenue that's generated. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so now we need a motion to approve the music manager. Could I ask an additional oh, yeah. question? So it seems to me that in our audit each year we get uh, dinged. Yes. for our oversight of student fundraising dollars and perhaps Marcy would weigh in on whether this may help us if ever so slightly with the auditors um, it, it could except for that we have so many student activities that we're still gonna get dinged um, it will help you know that one activity but all our other activities still do cash deposits manage their own funds so yeah. it'll still be in there wanted the symphonic band had over a hundred thousand dollars in revenue mm. slash okay. in 1617 will this also will this person also manage the cash received at the concerts too mm. that's I don't think so it's strictly for managing those individual okay. accounts but we'll still get a good ding yeah okay thank you so my impression is that this might be a way for us to begin the process of having greater accountability mm -hmm. in our fundraising and record keeping efforts. Perhaps it's a model that we'll take in future years to a greater extent. So at this point, I'm comfortable making the motion to approve the proposal as presented. Okay. Of the music manager. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Director Robinson. We have a second. Second. Which of you wants it? Bobby's got it. Okay. Okay, so we have a first from Director Robinson, a second from Director Nystrom. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll now go on to site reports and communications. And first up, we're going to have Chris Zemer and Dave Bergeron come up and talk about what's happening on the building projects. Actually, it'll be Natalie off from our office with me. Dave will be a spectator today. <laughs> Unless needed, Chris. Unless needed. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're here to give you an update. Uh, three main items on uh, tonight's update are uh, project updates for four of the first five projects, uh, property acquisition, and then also bidding strategies, a little bit more on that. So um, just wanted to show this slide just to show that the team is growing. Um, you've seen earlier versions of this, and this will continue to expand, but uh, as of right now, um, WSN's brought on a lot of their uh, sub-consultants 
uh, O&E is on board as well, and then those teams will continue to grow as well. We'll share that information in future presentations. So. Uh, schematic design update for Harrison Elementary. This is just a rough uh, site plan of what we're looking at. Again, this is a draft in process. Uh, we're not coming to you tonight for approval of anything. That will be a future date, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but again, just showing that uh, expanded parking and bus uh, drop-off is planned for this site, along with just uh, a rough idea of how the building's going to grow there. Uh, the next slide shows kind of how those building uh, plans are developing. So uh, the, the blue area, for the most part, is the existing building, and then the new addition is actually adding on to the north and to the west of the existing facility. So. Do you want to talk about just some of the highlights that we see on this one sure. so far? That have sure. Been so core for the brand new gym will be added as part of this project. Uh, new secure office with the main entry. Uh, you may note that the new entry is going to be pointed to the north, uh, but accessible from the west uh, from the main parking lot. And then the classroom areas are uh, being organized around resource areas. Uh, and the locker bay is being outside of that. So clustering those uh, around grades. So what you'll see is three sections clustered around a resource area uh, with special education uh, being on the lower level as well. Uh, the new elementary in Baxter. Um, this one, uh, site discussions ongoing with the city of Baxter. So we're really starting to ramp that up. Um, so we don't really have a plan to show you yet, but uh, that will be coming in coming meetings, an idea of how that's laying out. But independent of that, we've been developing the building, uh, is that can be mirrored, rotated uh, on the site as needed. Um, and really the, the core items that need to be addressed in the building are being addressed in the plan. So again, uh, on the left there, a secure main entry that feeds into the office. Uh, the cafeteria space is located to the north of that. Um, a gym that can be subdivided into two stations. Uh, the kindergarten wing is on the upper right uh, there. And then we've got grade sections on the lower portion of the plan, uh, one and two on first level and grades three and four on upper, uh, with that main spine uh, really housing the specialty spaces, being the media center, the music room, uh, art, and then the locker bay is being off the circulation of that. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the, if there is additional growth needed for enrollment in the future, what some of your planning is? On so that? as you can see the dashed lines, uh, this building's planned for five sections. Um, just showing that we are keeping growth in mind and how that six section would be added in the future. Uh, so those dashed areas up on the kindergarten area and then also down on each wing, it would be fairly easy to add that on in the future. And another gymnasium as well. Yep. If they... And the plan actually, it's not dashed in there, but the gym could basically flip to create another gym station, uh, which would give you four subdividable spaces that could be used. Hmm. Uh, Niswa Elementary, uh, this one just showing an overall site plan and concept. Where we're at, uh, the, the gray is the existing building, the beige being the new. And then the dark blue kind of, that's a master plan idea. If you had to add some more square footage in the future, to, that would be an area we could do that. Chris, just, yep. I, I couldn't see it Sorry. on it, but did the front office ever get moved on that? Yes, so I'll, in the floor plan here. So in the, just south of where the library is, uh, we moved the main entry to that link area there. Um, and in doing so, we relocated the early child ed to the southern wing, along with kindergarten down in that area, expanding the cafeteria. And then um, a unique situation, as I talked about, not uh, necessarily building the site out now, but planning for future growth, possibly, on the south side of the building. So right now, we have a two-story classroom wing up on top, along with the gym expansion that gets you to two subdividable gym stations. Uh, and then three sections on each uh, floor there as well as currently is shown with special ed uh, divided throughout the building. <clears throat> uh, Brainerd High School, I apologize, this one's a large building so I had to kind of cut it in half to make it fit. Um, but the cut is basically through the main entry as it exists right now. 
Um, so the idea there is that uh, the, the beige areas are um, the additions or what we're calling pure addition right now with a little bit of remodel space. Uh, the green color is uh, remodel or renovated area there. Uh, I guess some highlights on this one is the performing arts is still up in the northeast corner. Uh, we're pushing it towards the street though to give it a little bit more prominence along with the support spaces off the back and then the classroom uh, wing that we had originally planned that was kind of in the front of the building is actually on the back now. Um, two or one to take advantage of some of those views in the, the valley there and then two would actually provide some access for special ed that didn't really exist in the old formerly layouts that we were using um, as part of the bond planning. On the south side, we have the pool addition and rework of the uh, CTE area, along with uh, addition of an extra gym space in that area as well. And that's the main level. So on the lower level south, there's a little bit of rework of space uh, by the pool and then uh, for the new pool, pool mechanical that'll be done. And then on the north side, this is just showing that upper level, again, the classroom wing that's filling out that space and then the upper level of the performing arts. Uh, because the, the capacity is 1,200 seats, it likely is gonna require a balcony to accommodate that on our building footprint right now. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're gonna run all the space on the north side of the building. So, uh, One item I may not have mentioned um, is where the locker, where I think they call it the senior locker area right now. That's actually slated to become the new media center uh, to try to take advantage more of the courtyard that exists right now. Uh, we're doing that with the new commons that exists around there, uh, trying to take advantage of daylight, but the thought is moving the media center up into that area will allow, one, some views, but possibly some future use of that courtyard area for instructional space as well. I'll turn it over to Natalie. Can we go back for a second? Yeah. Do you want to take the, the high school drawing and talk a little bit about the work groups that we had last week on sure. Thursday and some of the highlights and what came out of those highlights of those meetings and uh, the tours that are planned for two weeks from now? So we have three work groups in, in addition to the core group that meets for this building. Uh, those being uh, health and wellness and pool, uh, the theater and performing arts, and then the CTE group. Uh, those all met last Thursday, so we had members from the community, members from businesses, along with staff at those meetings. Uh, and really just went through the diagrams you're seeing above uh, to show them what we're currently planning and then just getting input from them of what they see the community needs are, the community wants, so we can capture those now, start taking those on effect. And then also capturing what we want to see on tours, uh, which we'll be taking on the 21st for the pool, the 23rd for the theater, and then sometime in mid to late September for the CTE spaces as well. We'll be touring uh, multiple high school facilities that have done recent projects in I would say the last eight years or sooner um, and looking at how they've done it, what they have come across in doing their projects so we can learn from those things. So the 21st, we will go on tours looking at Four different pools, if I remember correctly, yep. down in the cities. And on the 23rd, we'll be looking at performing arts centers. And then in September, we'll be going and doing the career and technical education. So. Correct. And the kids are in session. Right. So, yeah, good. Good evening. It's been a little bit since I've been with you. Uh, we, As we talk about the background for property acquisition, we're talking about before the bond referendum, we were going through different um, areas of town and looking at different sites, and that's really what we're going to continue to do. We're going to talk about the process tonight, and then we'll get going um, on property acquisition because the, the bond passed, or the referendum passed. So the background through the bond referendum planning process, the school board committed to enhancement of existing facilities throughout the district. As part of the voter-approved enhancements, Property acquisition was included to supplement, add parking, and maintain green space offset by building additions. So that's really what we're focusing on since the referendum passed. They've been working, you know, the architects and ICS and everyone to kind of finalize what that property acquisition looks like. So the mission statement that we've come up with is Brainerd Public Schools is committed to an open and fair property acquisition process for our residents. 
while balancing the need for their property, fairness for the homeowners and our taxpayers. And that's really important. That's what we're striving to accomplish here, that it's a very fair process and we're committed to helping each property owner. Okay. The process starts um, between assistance through ICS and the design team. You know, when they identify the property is required to fulfill the improvements at the sites, and that's really what they've been honing in on since the referendum passed. So once that happens, the owners of the properties um, that are identified for acquisition will be contacted by the school district and myself, and will so that they are informed before it becomes public. So then once that's done, the public, <clears throat> we will have a public hearing. We have to do, um, schedule it and um, publicize it 10 days in advance of the public. So the public can come in and talk to you um, at the public hearing. And then once that public hearing's done, we will collect um, public um, comments still for another 30 days. So once that 30 days is over, we'll have to respond in writing to the people that spoke at the public hearing and then anyone who spoke or submitted something in writing too. So once that's all done is where we get back together and you guys will vote on authorize the acquisition of the identified properties in the relocation program. So it really is a process so that it's thought out and people can speak to it. So what if a property owner just totally declines to sell? Well, we, we will, we have not ever had that happen. I'm happy to say that we have had um, great luck and success in working with people. Um, but there is a tool, it, there is tools to use and that's something you guys would have to decide as a board. Okay. So once you authorize the acquisition, then the proper notices are um, given to the property owners. There's quite a sequence of notices throughout the whole process. Um, and then the appraisals will be ordered, um, including a review appraisal. So we will order an appraisal of their home. We will have a review appraiser appraise it also, just to double check, make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And then we will work with them on producing um, offers based on these appraisals. And then once that happens too, once the official offer is made, they are set to do some relocation benefits. So an appraisal is done on the basis of what has sold in the market, and that's what we'll offer for the property. Then they have a relocation component on what's on the market comparable to their property too. So there might be a, another piece there. Included after that is moving costs, closing costs. Um, they get incidentals such as when their driver's license you know, renews to the new address, you pay for that. If they have cable that they need to be, have rehooked up at their new spot, they get that reimbursed. So it's really um, up and beyond what you'd have if you were just selling your house. So there are benefits to it. Um, and really, we try hard to find everyone where they are in life. Some want to, um, that maybe their kids have moved out, so they want to downsize and they'd be comfortable with that. Um, just different spots in their life, and so we just work really hard to find them a place that they'll be happy with too. So. Um, are the appraisers, you use local appraisers? We will be, yeah. I haven't identified them yet at this time. Yeah. Any other questions? When you come to the board, you'll come with all the properties we need to acquire for all the different locations, yes. correct? So we'll do it one time. And when do you think that will be? Uh, probably either the end of this month or early September. Oh, then wow. One of the next two board meetings for sure. Mm -hmm. We're very close to having those all nailed down. So. And then how long before the public meeting? Probably. Um, we can either decide at the next board meeting to post that meeting and then land it on the same day as the September 10th board meeting. Um, that's probably what we're leaning towards right now, but we can talk about that more. Okay. Uh, with administration moving forward. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Thing. Forward. So, 
Yeah. So he's married. One last item on the agenda. Yeah. We can skip this if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've talked plenty today. So. Um, so bidding strategies. We've talked a little bit about this with you guys in the past, um, but just wanted to reiterate kind of the, the rules and laws we're bound by as we move forward with projects and what options we have in terms of getting local contractor involvement and contractor involvement in general. Um, but I have the state statute up there. We're really governed by the Uniform, uniform Municipal Contracting Law. And in that law, there's some set values that you may or may not be aware of. Um, anything under 25,000 is considered a quote. Uh, you're required to get two of them, but there's a little bit more freedom with this, um, mainly because it is a small scope, but you can, um, you can really go with the lower the high if you want on this version. Um, you're not dictated by the rules of a, a sealed bid in this environment, uh, and it's not required for advertising for bids. So an example of this would be, there's a very small office remodel we need to accomplish and we need to get quotes while we send it to two local contractors. It's usually a very good tool to get locals involved. Um, they both submit a quote. One may or may not have a good reputation. One may have a great, but the great one has a higher number. We have the freedom to choose in that situation. Um, it gets a little more ratcheted up as we go through these values, um, but that is one tool we have. So the next threshold is anything between 25,000 and 175,000. And this was just recently increased from 100,000 uh, effective August 1st of this year. Uh, the governor signed that into law. Um, so again, we need two quotes minimum. Uh, again, we don't need to advertise in this situation and you can do either sealed or direct negotiation with the contractor. Um, and a choice can be made again, based on what we believe best value uh, under that uh, statute there. So. Again, some freedom there as well to some of our smaller scopes that we may see on some of the projects that aren't getting into the hundreds of thousands. Uh, we may be able to uh, tone and target some local contractors or contractors from the surrounding regions such as St. Cloud or Duluth that we know have a great reputation that we really want involved. <clears throat> so then uh, the one we'll most likely be dealing with is the scenario listed here. Contract value is above 175,000. Uh, so with that, there's quite a few steps we have to follow. Advertisement for bids required. So that has to be published in the district's publication or record, which I believe is the Brainerd Dispatch. Um, advertisement has to be two weeks prior to bid, and it's really two consecutive publications. So if you have multiple dates in a week that they publicize, you just have to make sure you're in separate weeks prior to that bid date. Uh, but again, you're, you're publicizing it publicly so that everyone knows that you are bidding a project and there is a bid date. Um, with this version, uh, sealed bids are required, uh, opened and read aloud at a bid opening. Uh, bids also have to include a bid bond, bid form, bid bond and 5% of the submit, uh, bids submitted, and acknowledgement of compliance with the Minnesota Responsible Contractor Law, uh, which is a recent law that was passed a couple years ago that uh, is just making sure that you are paying the wages you're supposed to be paying following all laws that, uh, that you are bound by as a contractor. Um, award is to the lowest responsible bidder based on typically low bid. Uh, there really, in this scenario, really isn't another way. Um, the next item here is a way around that, um, but there are some items that come with that. So there's an alternate method of bidding uh, that's available called best value. Um, with that, basically what you do is you set up a series of criteria. Uh, most often, cost is still the bigger portion of that. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but our experience has been it's usually still weighted about 60% of that scoring system. Uh, but other items like can you meet the schedule, uh, experience as a contractor, are all brought in and the scoring system is developed and then you, you judge the bids received on that. It gives you a little bit of freedom to not necessarily go with the low bid. Um, but it, it, it's quite a few more steps involved than your typical uh, bid process. Um, one thing with this method is that it does not guarantee local contractors are awarded the bids. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, while it does wait, it doesn't mean that a contractor that's 500 miles away could submit a bid that blows everyone out of the water on scoring. So I stress that on the next slide, there's a lot of different ways to make sure we get local contractor aware of the project and we get local contractor involvement. 
Uh, oh, and then, are you looking yeah. at, like you'll have a criteria for all kinds of different pieces that have to be included in every bid? And if there are pieces that are missing and such, then the district has the right to um, not accept that one or to modify? Yeah, the strategy we'll be using with this is probably multiple bid packages per project. So we, the projects will be broken down more so than your typical uh, single prime bid where we have one contractor per project. So there will, along with that gives you opportunities for, again, local contractor involvement because it's not such a a big, large dollar amount that you're shooting for. Uh, but it also does, if we've got a questionable contractor, to vet that out a little bit more, uh, really question whether they have a valid bid, and if not, um, move on to the second low. Um, you also have instances where a contractor will make a mistake on bid day, and they'll request that they pull. Um, that happens not that often, but it will happen. It may happen during this process, mm -hmm. in which case you have the opportunity to go to the second bid, and then you start <clears throat> Last slide here. Um, so things we do as a company, as ICS does, to make sure that we get contractor involvement. And I would say, being from the implementation side of the company, we pride ourselves on this quite a bit. Uh, we're very proactive in what we do to make sure that contractors know there's projects bidding, uh, that we know we're hitting the market at the right time, um, and that we know that we're going to get the best cost when we go out to bid. So. Um, one of those is we have a we keep an internal bidding calendar that we invite contractors to be an open part of. It's free; it doesn't cost them anything. Um, a lot of the bigger contractors and uh, subcontractors, I would say, in the mechanical electrical trades, are already subscribing to it. Um, but we have a list of like of over 3,500 3, contractors in our directory, not just between Minnesota and Upper Wind West, um, that either have access to this or we know of that are out there as contractors that do K-12 schoolwork. Uh, another thing we do is pre-bid meetings and walkthroughs for each project. Uh, one, it gains the interest of the contractors, gives them an opportunity to both hear about the project and gain familiarity with the project. Um, that's not to say that they don't have the freedom to come and visit the site on another day, but these are really intended, you know, we're there, the architects there, the engineers are there to really answer some questions and also gather items that uh, may be in the documents that need to be clarified through an addendum prior to bid day. So uh, ICS also proactively garners interest through calling and a meeting one-on-one -on -one with interested contractors. Um, like I mentioned, it, learning the availability of building trades have to take on the work, uh, realistically complete the work during the plan schedule. And you know we have a pretty good network with the contractors out there in the K-12 education market, and we are constantly talking with them, whether it's on another project and just asking them, you know, what's your next fall looking like? What's your next spring looking like? And they'll actually tell us as well that, well, there's a lull coming or a perceived lull. Um, we'd really look for something to be bid in this time. Do you have anything coming out? So again, those are a lot of the things that we do proactively to make sure that we get interest in the project. And those are things we'll do on these projects as well. Um, sorry, I had two more. Uh, bid dates are strategically scheduled to maximize interest and understanding current construction markets. Again, if it doesn't make sense to bid something in the spring and wait a couple months, uh, we'll definitely advocate for that. Uh, we've found that that usually ends up in a better bid day than trying to force uh, the issue in getting bids. Uh, and then packaging work scopes to maximize opportunities for local and regional contractors to bid. Um, again, utilizing those different thresholds we have as well as uh, tailoring the bid packages for the workforce in the Brainerd Lakes area as well as the region. Questions? So, Chris, you kind of time out the bidding process for, you know, I mean, it's not all have to be bid now for a project that doesn't start for three years. Correct. Yeah, yeah you're Correct. still timing all that out too. Correct. Uh, we won't start bidding anything likely until uh, early spring late winter, this upcoming 19. Um, and then from there, there'll probably be, I wouldn't say a regular schedule of bidding work, but it'll be going on for a good year and a half, I'd say, uh, off and on, depending on where the projects are, because there's the first five projects we're doing, but then keep in mind there's the projects we aren't designing right now that will probably kick off in spring and start to follow as well. So there will be a time where 
we're either working or constructing any one of 11 sites, if not more. Are you thinking that we'll break ground April-ish, next spring? Uh, there are some sites we'll, as soon as frost is out, we should be able to break ground. There's others, uh, such as the high school, uh, because that is such a large project, um, that, and it, we've seen success in this where we'll bid out probably late spring. Um, because really what we'll be looking to is get the footings in the ground for the first phase of work and then that'll be a, a two-year round project working through the school year as well, so. When you do the bidding, approximately how long does it take to order all the materials and make sure that they're, that we've got access to them when we need them when groundbreaking takes place and the building begins? So typically we see about a two-month lag, I'd say. So we would want to bid two week, two months earlier than when we think we'd break ground for the yep. most part? Ideally, some of the materials are less than that, um, such as rebar and concrete. That's pretty readily available. And really all there is is a shop drying review once we have a ward, uh, just to confirm that they are providing the right uh, materials and the layout. Uh, the things like steel, precast, uh, precast tilt-up panels, those are kind of that more two-month to three-month period. So. While the other work's being done, those are being ordered, so it sequences throughout the project. So at some point in time, we, we have to decide whether we want it to go like with that best values process, correct? Yeah, when we get closer to those, we can definitely have those conversations. Do any of the building materials uh, cost? Does that concern you at all? I've heard steel is going up. Uh, personally, on the projects I've been working on, I have not seen an impact yet. And actually, um, costs have been holding. Uh, even with the, the change order costs that we've seen on other projects, we really haven't seen an increase yet. That's not to say it's not coming. Uh, it just has not been realized yet. So. Any other questions? <clears throat> oh, yes, sorry. Um, so uh, the next board meeting uh, will likely be coming for approval of schematic design for at least two of these sites. Um, the other sites will lag behind that slightly, but um, just wanted to make you aware there'll be another presentation likely at the next board meeting. Great, it's good to see it moving forward. A lot of work has already been done. Yeah. Pretty thorough. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have a traffic study update from Tim Hall. Good evening. Chairs down. <laughs> a couple books. Did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> um, I'd like to give you an update on the traffic study that has uh, been going on for the Baxter schools, we're calling it. So for both Forest View Middle School and the new elementary school in Baxter. It's proposed to be east of Forest View Middle School, east of Knollwood Drive. Um, it's been quite a process. It is uh, coming, hopefully, to some closure. Uh, just a quick update reminder on the scope. Um, the traffic study is going to be kind of this foundational document. It's not going to have the one perfect arrangement of roadways. It's actually looked at a series of alternatives. So you have Forest View Middle School. We've looked at improving the drop-off pickup lane and accesses. We've looked at the new Baxter Elementary School. Uh, on the west of the new Baxter Elementary School would be Knollwood Drive. On the east of the new Baxter Elementary School, new elementary school in Baxter. On the east side would be Jasper Wood. It's not a roadway that's there right now. It's on the city's uh, plans, so to speak, um, to extend. So 
you've got those options and then you're looking at Knollwood Drive and the different things that need to be done on that and Jasper Wood Drive and then take it another step further you're looking at some of the intersections that are outside of the immediate school area so Highway 370 run 371 and County Road 48 as an example or Highway 210 and County Road 48 so the traffic study has a lot of variables involved and so that's why we're not going to come down to just one exact this is this is it we've got uh, 12 options actually and the different ramifications of those 12 options with all those combinations going on um, we've sat down with uh, the city of Baxter we've sat down with some smaller groups at the school district we're awaiting comments from Crow Wing County and MnDOT um, and then we'll package up the draft report uh, and I think there was an executive summary in your packet um, it's a draft um, and we'll take that and then provide that information already there's meetings going on starting to look at next steps costing out some of these uh, alternatives meeting with the city you, you need to meet with the city of Baxter because you need permits from the city of Baxter because you're involving public infrastructure in the different land and zoning situations. Uh, MnDOT and Crow Wing County are going to weigh in as far as how these alternatives and the traffic impact their intersections or intersections that they're responsible for. Another reminder is we are dealing with, and it's plus or minus, but a half hour in the morning and a half hour at roughly 3 p.m. very concentrated very large numbers of vehicles and we all you know want to pull up right at the front door and we all want to get away within five minutes it's pretty difficult uh, economically to do something like that so but we are looking at you know how do we improve the situation with this additional traffic generator moving uh, to east of Knollwood or east of the Forest View Middle School uh, hundreds of pages is, are in the draft report. I tried to condense those hundred pages into this time frame. Questions? There, there, oh, let me add, there won't be, we won't be coming to you with a final report and saying, please approve this final report because it, it has options, it has numbers in it, it has mitigations, uh, po potential uh, uh, impacts. So similar to the Brainerd High School area traffic study, um, we ended up there, I believe, with about three, actually kind of six options, um, which is going to be used going forward. But same thing with this Baxter Schools traffic study. So we're not asking for any official formal approval. We wanted to update you. Um, and when the final report is, is finalized, I can go through some of the options, but it is pretty lengthy. Um, questions? That's probably the better thing to do. Questions? So do you anticipate then eventually, Tim, coming? You said there were 12 options, and maybe you'll come forward with here's the top three or something? I think that will occur. Uh, I could do that for sure with the traffic study. I don't know about top three. It might be top two, top four, depending on the alternatives. But I think the uh, uh, approval from the board the the concurrence from the board will start to come when we work in the next steps what I would call feasibility studies of taking the traffic data and actually working out okay this is what we're going to do to Knollwood this is what we believe with the traffic with the costs with operational issues is the best thing for Forest View Middle School so I, I would anticipate that you would see something like that maybe not maybe you won't see me anymore on traffic study which usually that's when it Lots of applause goes up. But <laughs> so um, it's, it's going to come probably more so in the next steps of feasibility study, costing, things like that. Yep. Well, question. it seemed like in your executive summary, too, you were limiting it down from that. We're trying. Well, oh, my goodness yeah. sakes, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It sounded like there were a couple that. Correct. Uh, just real quick, um, one of the options, and we gave uh, – a clean slate, so to speak, when we started to look at traffic numbers. One option was to make Knollwood Drive a one-way south mm -hmm. from County Road 48 down to Mapleton, which I think would be fairly dramatic for people that are used to a two-way. But when you start to look at the operational efficiencies of a one-way, 
one way in, one way out. It, it made sense, again, for those two roughly half hour time frames. Um, there were some questions brought up about you know, access going north, et cetera. So, and then there's the two-way option, and there's even an option of uh, blocking off a portion of Knollwood and making cul-de-sacs from the south and from the north. Um, so then you start to expand those options with Jasper Wood, with elementary school facing one direction or the other, with the internal enhancements to Forest View Middle School operations. You're right, the, the alternative is just expand exponentially, but then we try to bring it back down into something that could be um, used for these subsequent meetings. And then once we get the cost, some of them will fall off just because they're cost prohibitive. Correct. Right now we have what they call mitigations. Um, you know, what might need to be done at this intersection? Well, when you start to cost those different mitigations, right turn lane signals, roundabouts, you start to, like you said, start to maybe drop off some for cost reasons. So Tim, does it look like uh, the extension in Jasper, what is becoming more in favor with what the entrance to the elementary school will be? The traffic study um, kind of gave a tip of the hat to when you have Jasper Wood in place, the traffic uh, flow isn't all concentrated on Knollwood. And so the traffic flow uh, is improved uh, having said that, there still are some enhancements, mitigations that need to be done at surrounding intersections. And so, you know, with the cost of Jasper Wood, with the cost of those mitigations, that might not be so uh, um, impressive if you were to funnel everything to Knollwood. That's where I'm saying these next steps of looking at costs and, and negotiating with the, the land and the city and whatnot will start to start to funnel that out. We're still kind of up on the big side of the funnel. So I don't, I mean, the traffic study in and of itself says yes, having Jasper Wood will help with traffic, but it's not, it's not the definitive thing. You need to still have the discussions with the city and, and whatnot and costing. Okay. Other questions? Is the city open to sharing some of those costs? with say the extension of Jasper Wood, because they would also benefit from that the, future development. The general approach, and this is pretty general, in Baxter is that it's, it's based on a front footage. So the school district has a, would pr be proposed to have a certain front footage, and then there's front footage of city property. So, Looking at it that way, yes, the city will participate as part of this initial construction. Um, it may feel like you're paying the whole thing, but um, it's going to be based on these negotiations with land, with infrastructure, the way they split their costs. Okay. Good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. And now we have Sarah Porsche to talk about one-to-one -one devices. Hello. Hi. To pull up the presentation. And I'm kind of doing both here. So I'm here tonight, along with other, some representatives from the high school and our digital team, to bring forward um, a plan that we're hoping that you will approve of and that we can continue um, working toward a one-to-one -one come next fall at the high school. So I'm going to talk you through um, what we've done and what we're hoping to do in the future. I wanted to start with our vision statement because I think that's important for us always to remember why we're here and um, and to point out in this we made a commitment that we're going to prepare our learners for an ever-changing global society and that global society and that ever-changing global society has devices in it and so we really feel like we're at a point it's really important that we provide this access for um, our high school students at this time 
So here's our goals with um, providing this one-to-one -one technology. First is it to increase student techno technology skills upon graduation. This came up again in our CTE meeting the other day, and I was just, it was floored me because it's come up every time we meet with businesses. They tell us how important it is that we get devices in our kids' hands because we know that a smartphone is not a professional device. It's not valid to use in a professional atmosphere. And also, um, we hear over and over again that we need to be preparing our students for, to go into jobs with basic technology skills. How do we compose an email that is a professional email? How do we use a spreadsheet to do basic, um, basic computation and spreadsheets? That sort of thing. Um, so we heard that again um, just this last week at our CTE meeting. Um, we would like another goal is to increase student engagement and motivation, as well as increase differentiated learning opportunities. Now, um, there has not been any research that directly ties a one-to-one -one initiative to raising test scores, okay? But there is a lot of uh, um, research that shows lots of these other things that raise test scores. So um, for instance, for our principal academy, I just had to bring this up. I'm using this as part of my research. And in this great book, it has um, three of the top 10 things is that increased student achievement, formative assessment, um, being able to self-grade, like see their grades right away and be able to look at charts and stuff around that. And then um, immediate feedback. Those are all things that we can really enhance if we had devices in our kids' hands. So even though this research doesn't show that the device itself impacts that, we know that the device can aid in the efficiency of reaching those um, goals. And then our last thing is the guarantee. We really need to guarantee, we want to guarantee the equality of device access to all of our students because we know that all of our students don't have access to a um, laptop, a professional device that they can um, do work on and learn from. So I'm not gonna go through all of this, you've seen this before, but we have years of history behind this, starting when we made the commitment to the fiber that we've talked about before, the fiber ring, all the way through, up until um, this last year, uh, Mr. Martha and I, we were ready to go 512 with one-to-one, -one, and we had talked about that. We held some meetings, and, um, and we got some awesome feedback from our staff and, and some of our community members. And we decided that it was time from that feedback that we needed to step back a little bit, reassess how we wanted to do this, and now we feel like we really have the plan to move forward. Um, so this is kind of a time frame that I want to show you. Um, we're at August 13th, and I'm presenting this initial plan for you to see if there's any big questions that you have before we move forward. The next time that you would see us is the January 14th, right around there meeting. Our team will be meeting to um, get all of the forms and policies and all of those things together for you to take a look at and approve at that, um, hopefully around that January time. Again, you'd see us around April, in April, and that would be when, after we've done all of the research around which device is gonna be best for our students. And so then we would bring that device forward to you, along with the recommendation with the cost and all of that for approval from the board. And our goal would be an August 2019 rollout. We actually gave um, the high school staff two different options. We said we could roll that out in January because we were really, you know, budgetary-wise, we were kind of set up to do this in January, or should we wait till August? Overwhelmingly, the staff um, really felt like August would be a good rollout just to wait till that summertime and start next fall. So money, right? We always, <laughs> we always have to look at the money. This is an overall um, budget that I worked with Steve Lund with originally, and now Marcy and I have been working through it. I want to show you the next one, though, that kind of pulls out specifically these costs. When we met with staff, one of the big things was coupling um, the curriculum and the technology money together. That was um, a lot of feedback came from that. They really wanted to see that uncoupled. So we've successfully done that. So we've taken, we've been able to um, figure out our budget so that it's, um, curriculum money is not included at this time in a device rollout, okay? So how that looks is $20,000 from our BHS, um, from the BHS budget, and then $80,000 from the technology budget. What I get all the time is why do we all of a sudden have money for technology? We're putting in a state-of-the-art Mac lab this month for graphic design and production that we're so excited about that we wouldn't have been able to do before. So people ask me that all the time, how come we have money? Well, there's a few different reasons. 
Um, standardization of equipment is a big part of that. So everyone has the same thing. So instead of a teacher coming to someone at the district office and saying, I need da 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 da, and then we just put money there, and then the next teacher comes, we put money there, and we kind of just you know, throw in the dart at the, at the wall, now we have a plan. And so that's actually saved us quite a lot of money in our technology budget. Um, and in our, high, in our um, building budgets as well, because it used to be that the building would have to put in money toward these labs, toward these specialty labs or different projects that we were doing. Not anymore. We have developed a long-range um, technology um, plan. What this does is um, I broke, we've broken it down into devices, specialty computer labs, presentation systems, and then our infrastructure. And it shows you the year that we need to refresh all of these. This is something that is new <laughs> for our district, and we're very excited to have it. So um, basically, we can budget now for all of the things that are going to be coming toward us, and we can actually plan that out. And so we've staggered our specialty labs. We've staggered when we do our devices, all of those things. That's why we have the money to be able to put forth into these initiatives. Another thing I really want to point out, too, is um, grants. Um, specialty funding, things like that, our maker spaces. As you know, we've gotten grants for those. Those are things that would have cost us 10,000 here, 20,000 there, that now we have amazing community um, donors that have come together and, and done that for us. So I wanted to point this out because right now, with the high school one-to-one, -one, we can do that with all of, within our budget from those things. When we refresh, however, in 2021-22, no matter what, we need to refresh our devices at Forest View during that year, okay? Our elementary, if you look at the long range plan again, that um, our elementary devices are good till 2022 because they're staggered. Um, our main concern is when Forest View has to be refreshed. We are looking right now, there's a $60,000 gap there, okay? But um, Marcy and I have talked a lot, Lane and I have talked a lot. We've really done a lot of looking at this in two years. We're confident that um, we will have this figured out through changes in programming. We never know what technology is going to look like. You know how much devices will cost and things. They just keep coming down, down, down in price, um, along with um, our facilities um, plans and things and the way that we're um, being so fiscally responsible there as well. So we really feel like in two years um, we will have that taken care of. And then you'll also see that when Forest View comes in to refresh, um, $20,000 comes out of their capital budget as well to put toward that, um, that cost of the one-to-one. -one. Um, something that changed from talking to the staff is actually our Forest View one-to-one. -one. And so you'll be hearing more about that later. Right now, from what we've heard, we're leaning toward a fifth and sixth stay in school one-to-one -one model. So they'd have it in school. Every student would have access in school, but they wouldn't necessarily bring them home. There's a lot more talk to go around about that, but that's what the staff is really, and parents have come down back to us with. And then looking at a seventh and eighth grade go home model similar to 9-12 in the future. And the timing for that would be during this refresh? Correct, yep, the 2021. Um, we, we have enough devices that we may be able to do some piloting, especially with the in-school, because we don't really have a lot of policies that need to go along with that. So we're looking to do some piloting with that sooner than that 2021. Staff development, as we know, is a big part of this. So, um, and of course, we, I work really closely with Mr. Murtha, and we, um, we want to make sure that our staff is comfortable using these to really integrate it into their classrooms. I just talked at the, um, the curriculum improvement meeting the other day about how we don't want people to add this on top of what they're doing. We need it to be integrated into what we're doing to really enhance what we're doing. So, to help our staff with that, um, I'm really taking an um, intense look at BHS right now and really working with them a lot, getting them ready for the one-to-one. -one. And um, a Google form has already gone out asking them to rate themselves on different um, skills. And um, that allows us to really target who needs what um, skills for training, along with which departments really need which things. So we're not taking time for people who already know how to do something. We're really targeting them. And then also we're utilizing our um, our experts that we have within the building that love to train anyway. And so we'll be utilize them to help train their peers. Um, focused departmental training, like I said, um, before and after school training will continue to be offered. Um, individual training, we love going in the classroom and co-teaching these things. So if there's something that a teacher wants to jump into, we have support that can go in and help them with that. 
um, the teachers training teachers, hands-on training, the in-classroom support, and then of course there's gonna be additional trainings and support as needed throughout the implementation because we just, things will come up. So there, this is our technology team at this point um, that's really doing the bulk of this work that's putting in the time to do that. Some of them are here today, and so I thought if you had any questions or you know, wanted to bounce anything off of them, they wanted to come and show their support for this as well. Um, you'll see Ms. Rusk is part of this as the principal, um, as well as Mr. Martha um, as teaching and learning, because like I said, we know that this goes hand in hand. Um, and then our, um, specifically Sean Tollefson, our BHS system administrator, is also part of this team and developing all of this because he's the one that provides the technical support for, for all of it. Um, so that's my presentation for this, for this part. Um, I guess what I'm looking for today is I'm looking for if you have any questions for me, if you see any big red flags that you would like me to further look at before we continue down the, um, the time frame, or if you're comfortable with us moving along that time frame, which I can put back up, and coming back to you with that, um, the policies and the forms and stuff that would be needed to move forward. The staff at BHS, I mean, you have the team, mm -hmm. but the whole entire staff, are they comfortable with this plan now? Yeah, it's really interesting because when we went to the staff, um, the forest view was the one that we needed to hold off on. When we um, had let the high school staff that we needed, that we were gonna wait, because we originally were hoping to get it out this fall, and we would let them know that we were gonna have to wait, overwhelmingly we got a, oh no, <laughs> you know? So I would say that the support is definitely there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the financing has been approved through Marcy and. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, and like I said, just that when we refresh, and whether we went one-to-one -one or not, we'd still be facing that. Okay. And so we have some work to do there before that comes, but we're confident that that will. Could you maybe just introduce for us some of the staff? Yeah. Because I don't think we all know. Definitely. Okay, so Ryan, <laughs> I think you guys know Ryan. He's been here with me a couple times, our network administrator, Ryan Schultz. Justin Barnhart. <laughs> He's our district system administrator in the office. Um, Emily Nyseth. She is um, family and consumer science at the high school. Uh, Lisa Lane, social studies at the high school. Um, Kirsten, um, I don't know, Morton, Morton Aldous. Aldous. <laughs> it's a hyphenated one, so I always get it wrong. And it, I forgot to point this out. I'm very excited about this because Kirsten and um, Lois are our assistive technology specialists through the Paul Bunyan Education Co-op. And so they'll actually be on the team to really focus on what our special education students, how, that, how the devices will impact them and their learning as well. And is there anyone else back there? Team. I think that's it, and Andrea and Tim, you know, so, <laughs> so that's who's here tonight. Um, many more wanted to come, but of course on a summer night, I got a lot of, oh, we're going to be out in pontoon, sorry. <laughs> so. so Sarah, are you looking for approval of a concept or the actual money that needs to be? You know, I'm going to kind of lean on Lane here because I, I was, um, I think we're looking for an approval to move forward on the whole thing on this timeline and everything. The money itself will come when we have that chosen device and the approval of that cost and everything. Lane, can you? Yeah, I agree with that. Before, before we say too much, I just have to give her and her team so much credit. Um, as you know, when I came here, we had implemented a one-to-one -one initiative prior to my coming, and Sarah has been on this thing ever since I met her, and she has been so excited about it. And I remember last year we were so close, but it, there were just different things, and I'd say, have you thought about, have you? And she, I tell you, she and that team have, they have analyzed this to a point that um, I am absolutely convinced that they have the right plan and the right timing, and I'm so proud of you and the work that you've done. So Thank you. kudos to you and, and all you guys. You've, you've worked so hard, so good work on this. This is exciting. Well, I would definitely recommend, though, that we get board approval, um, not only on the policies and procedures and so on, but also on the funding mechanism so that there's never any concern about the commitment to the one-to-one -one initiative. And so I would like you to come forward again with the entire package to bring forward. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. So not tonight, but to, as we move forward. Yeah, it's, it's not on the agenda for tonight, but I would have the whole thing with the policies, the procedures, and, and everything ready to go. And... Mm -hmm. um, if you just want our verbal, I mean, it sounds like, like Lane said, it's well thought out and yeah. it sounds, you know, if the teachers are on board and, mm -hmm. and we have the staff development training and the financing done, I think the board as a whole 
feels yeah. pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Sarah, <coughs> can you explain a little bit, Sarah, on the, the decoupling with the curriculum, which makes sense to me? What does this mean in the, in the line of textbooks then for high school? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if Mr. Murtha wants to specifically address that um, question on um, textbooks in the future. Textbooks in the future. Uh, in terms of the high school, if we move to one to one, we're going to, we're going to come up with you here this glass speaker on the right. It'd probably be nice, otherwise, they can't hear you on the recording. So is the question of will we get rid of textbooks, is that the core of the question? Ideally, yes. The short answer. The, the, the long answer is what we're trying to do with the high school is have the staff develop and curate their own digital resources relative to the state standards. So as they go through the curriculum process and identify what the priority learning is for each course, they're selecting or creating those resources from what we call open educational resources, things that are in imminent domain, or that have been prepared by other educational institutions and shared freeware-wise, or that they've created themselves. So in that sense, they will have tailored exactly the resource that they use. The minute you buy a textbook, the textbook is stale, particularly if it's in a content area that changes quickly. If you're doing current events, or if you were doing even technology, uh, so forms of curriculum. These things change so quickly that there's no textbook that can be, that can keep up with it. So what ultimately happens is 10 years into your textbook adoption, you're five years to seven years out of date and you're waiting for your turn to come back around on cycle. If we make it digital and make it curated by the staff, then they're able to update it as it needs to be updated. So could we see in, in your full presentation then the, the financial piece of the dollars investment on the one-to-one -one and then eventually the, the decrease in the textbook expenditures that we have? Is that something that we can? We can. We are years away from getting to that point. We have some transitional work to do in the background. We do have a backlog of unupdated curriculum resources of a bound nature, whether it's a textbook or other purchased resources. Moving to OER is not a switch we can flip. It will take several years to convert some of the core courses to that. They have to pull out individual units, do them for a while, fix those up, and then move on to the next unit. So we're not looking at a point where there isn't a curriculum budget for a couple of years. And I can't give you an exact time frame that off the top of my head. So, Tim, that's what I was going to ask. There was concern among staff. There was about concern among developing. staff about how fast we would move. What we had originally promised was that we would do one of two things. We would either give them a four to five year window where they would convert out units a couple at a time. Okay. This works very well for certain content areas. It does not work well for others. If you are in a uh, department of electives where you may have three, four, or five preps in a day, that's the number of courses times the number of units to convert. It's probably not realistic. If you were really only teaching one or two preps of core required courses, it is probably realistic. We gave them two pathways. One is the convert a piece out at a time, in which case what we do is we support a team through curriculum writing as we always have in the summer, that first week of June, and it's going to bled into the second, third week of June. We do a lot of curriculum writing in the summer. That's what a lot of that is for. Our first group moving through right now is high school science. We're also going to pilot another structure where we will stipend some, a team of a small team to create the course in its entirety. So we're not going to pay you by the hour like we do curriculum writing. We're going to say X number of dollars is what a semester course is worth. Your team creates it and your team gets uh, the des district advisory committee to recommend it for adoption to the school board, then we pay him and just pay a flat rate for all the members of the team. That way, teams that are ready to move fast can. We have to differentiate our approach to this. We can't move 400 or 200 some teachers lockstep. We're going to have some early adopters who are going to move fast. 
we're going to have some people who really want to wait and see how safe this water is before they jump in. Is there anything holding us back from hitting the January launch date? Yep. The only thing was the staff response to that. So the staff really felt that uh, January would be tough to do a rollout. So typically when I think the use of technology, I don't think about it in the, in the term of years. You know, it's days or weeks and flip the switch so that we can use that versus by the time we roll it out and convert over to textbooks, we'll be a, on a refresh cycle already <laughs> with these. So anything we can do, and I really love the fact that we're at this stage, but if there's anything we can do, every day is another day that we're, we're falling further behind. I appreciate that feedback, and that's something that our team can then bring back, because I do have a timeline for January as well, so we can always bring that back um, to the staff and have further conversations around that as well. Just from a, you know, from a student achievement, the, and I'm hoping these textbooks will allow it, but when they take a test, if they don't know how they did right after, right. we're missing the boat. Mm -hmm. When our students, when my kids have to wait days and weeks to find out how they did, yep. they're missing the, we're, we're just, and so every day, every year that goes by that those kids don't get that opportunity, we'll never get them back for that, so. Thank you, Tom, I appreciate yes. that. A lot harder, faster, would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have something to add? To, just to amplify on the answer about what's holding us back. The answer is time. Uh -huh. Teachers historically never created their own curriculum, they purchased it. So we're adding a task to their world. The, the way we're trying to add it is this is part of that continuous improvement process. So we're always revising a little bit as we go, always trying to circle in on that best way to do that. But the cost of time, either in Stipend, salaries, or time itself is what's holding us back. Yeah, There's only so much staff development time in the world. You can give me, all, you can give me more staff development time. How much time do our teachers spend grading a math or science project? And if it's automated, just think of the time. Technology, use it for a time saver, not, not that it's a negative. For the student. We, don't, we don't want to continue to debate this, but I, I would just encourage the, the quicker we could move on this, use of technology better because we're you know we're not the first ones at the race here and this technology has been out there for a long time we are so far and I know that Sarah pushes faster than I do um, it is good to be it is, it is good to be first but I'd like to be best well it's too late to be first <laughs> correct so we're that's why we're, we're, we're following my plan we're gonna try to be best um, <laughs> thank you for pulling this together though. Okay. So, so on this, um, I'm hearing that we have the go-ahead to move forward on our timeline or continue moving on our work and come back and report back to you. Mm -hmm. um, one other quick thing, I wanted to bring you an opportunity that we're offering our staff this year for the first time. Um, we are working with T-Mobile um, to provide our, opportunity, our staff the opportunity to get hotspots at a deeply discounted rate so they can get their internet at a deeply discounted government school rate moving forward. Um, we've been working with Marcy in the business department to figure this out. Um, it's no cost to the district. It's just, um, it's just a really great deal for our staff. Now that we have the laptops in their hands, they're wanting to bring them to the cabin and everywhere, and so not everyone has internet access, and so this will give them an opportunity to opt into that if they'd like. So I don't know if you have any questions about that, but I just wanted to make you aware that our staff will have that opportunity this year. Great. Okay. okay. Sarah and I do appreciate your enthusiasm too. It's fun to have someone yeah. come up and present like that. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah. I appreciate that. So you know, we don't, I'm almost wondering since you've given, you know, kind of the verbal authority, if we should vote on it, just make an amendment, vote on it to amend it. I, I can add it as an item five if, you, if someone wants to amend the agenda. Would the board be comfortable with that? And then she's got that and they, she can start working towards the, the policies, the procedures, all of that for implementation and or do you oh, want to vote on what? Just to move forward with the plan that she proposed tonight. I'm not comfortable with voting on a okay. concept plan that was not presented to us in writing in advance. Okay. It, yeah. Not a critic of the proposal, but mm -hmm. a critic of the process. Shall we um, have her put this together again and then at the August 27th meeting present that to the board? Would you like that? Sure. 
Would that be enough time if? Enough time for, for Sarah to get it done, yeah. So I just want to clarify, um, at the August 27th meeting, um, you would like to see the policies and everything? No, just the, just kind of in writing. Proposed. What you did today. Mm -hmm. And we would put it in hard copy so it could go on board books so they would have the chance to read all the fine details and, and uh, be really comfortable with the financial numbers and what that, because this is kind of quick. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. but. It's exciting. So, okay. Um, it, it, my feedback would be um, I'm aligned with Mr. Murtha. I'd rather see it done right than done quick mm -hmm. for the next meeting. So, if even the September 24th date looks like a reasonable timeline to present okay. more specifics. Okay. Thank you. I'll if work with Superintendent Larson. I mean, yeah. it, certainly, others of you can hold Sarah's feet to the fire, <laughs> but I'm not going to. I think to wait for uh, a good proposal. This is great what you, what you've presented here, but I think so we can get some more of the more of the details and maybe if, if there's policies, if you know the intent behind, um, you know some of these other pieces on there, I think would be great. You know, if kids are expected to take or will be taking these home, what are we doing for those that don't have the internet? Those kind Correct. of things. Okay, I'll work with Superintendent Larson on a time frame for that so that we get some really good stuff for you, okay? Okay, thank you. But just hurry up. <laughs> what was that? Just hurry up. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I like that. Can't get ahead of the teachers. So. That's funny. Yeah, I like that, Director Hagelin, though. We have to, you know, change is difficult for many people, but we have to lead that change. Mm -hmm. And we can't, we can't let it go the other way around. I agree. Or we'll, we'll be talking about this next year. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Okay, so now, now we move into the for action, for action item of our agenda. And first up, we have approval of the 2018-19 Security Officers Agreement for the Brainerd High School. RC is going to talk to us about that. And I didn't know if you uh, needed any more information, but I was just going to um, say that the Brainerd High School contract did not change at all. It's still two and a half officers. The only thing that changed was um, the hourly rate. It went from 1963 to 2002, which is about a 2% increase. And then same with the overtime rate. So no no changes yeah, other than the two percent increase is probably what we had in the budget for mm -hmm. that. Are there any questions on that contract? I would move to approve as presented. Second. Nice. <laughs> okay. So we have first from Director Hagelin, a second from Director Nystrom to approve the 2018-19 Security Offers Agreement for the for BHS. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And then we have the approval of the 2018-19 Security Officers Agreement for Forest View. And um, same thing here, it is still one officer. The major change was um, it, it ends December 31st due to the contract that was approved last month for the school resource officer. Um, that is tentative to start in January. And I did ask them about, you know, if that doesn't if for some reason they can't start until later, we do have a 30-day cancellation. So we can continue that service until we let them know. Okay. Otherwise, the hourly rate changed, um, and that was it. Any questions on that contract? Do I have a motion? I so move for the Thank you. approval of 2018-19 Security Officers Agreement for FMS. Second. So first from Director Campbell, a second. second. Oops. Did someone second already? I Director did. Kern did, yeah. Sorry. Second from Director Kern. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And then approval of the first reading of policy 610. Superintendent Larson, you're going to talk to that. Yeah. As we had talked about earlier this year, we wanted to bring forward our field trip policy uh, for board update and um, what we did is we took the MSBA model uh, revised policy 
And everything in policy 610, um, starting on the second page, is the revised recommendation from MSBA as far as updating this policy. One thing that we did do, and I do want you to know that this is first reading um, because it hasn't gone past the administrative team yet, but it will be brought forth to the administrators on Wednesday. But um, the, we're bringing it forward for first reading tonight because one of the things that we did is we added procedure updates to this policy. And so on the front page, basically it gives an overview of what um, we have discussed regarding procedures that we would like taking place when students leave for field trips um, uh, with either an advisor, a coach, a director, or something. And, and basically in a, in, a, in a nutshell is that um, each time role is taken, uh, each student needs to have a buddy uh, when roll call is taken, the student must um, answer individually, raise their hand so that you see the person when the roll call is taken, uh, that we will uh, double confirm it to make sure that everybody is checking to make sure that all of the students and the adults are um, on, the, on the bus that is being supported by the school district. We also um, usually have more than one chaperone on each bus, so um, it's not just the responsibility of one single person, but that we're going to all be accountable to ensure that we have all of our students and staff when we're going on these field trips. The other thing that we added is that um, when students, if they're going, let's say they're at a basketball game and they're going to go home with their parents, we not only need a note from the parent to say that the children are going home with the parent, but we also need to see them personally to make sure that the children are going with their parent or guardian. Um, so it's um, so that we're making sure that the note is um, supported and it's for sure that they're going with their parents. So these are the procedural recommendations that um, I am going to visit with the administrative team. Um, but to make sure that we kind of get this in action a little bit before school started, uh, when I met with um, chair and vice chair the other day, we decided to bring it forward to have the board read it for the very first time, and but it will not be approved until after the administrative team has had a chance to look at it. So I'd recommend approval of the first reading of this policy and any suggestions that the board has to, bring, to add to it. I have a couple concerns on mm -hmm. here. You want those now? Sure, yeah. Um, one is the, um, it says, Whenever leaving school grounds with a group of students, whether for a field trip or otherwise, mm -hmm. the otherwise, could that just be on a regular school day? I assume we're not on regular pickups. And then the piece on <clears throat> that was added about the buddy system, each student must be paired with the buddy. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're putting liability on, on another student, that whole paragraph. Okay. Doesn't seem right, but okay. I'd be interested what the admin comes back with on it. Okay. Any other feelings on that? Uh, I, well, I had a question about the procedures update. It, is it included here because it's intended to become part of the policy, or is this a procedure document that'll run hand in hand with the policy? It can be done either way. However, um, right now it's part of the policy, but it's, it's identified as a procedural uh, change that we would like to have done, but um, we can do it either way. Again, it's first reading. You're so. essentially wanting to amend the policy and mm -hmm. slip the word procedure in here, I assume. Yeah, it's just to make sure that... Step just, one, step two. Yeah, just so that we're making sure that we are double checking to make sure that we have all of the students on the bus. If it's a field trip, if it's a school activity, if it's a game, something like that, that we're having them raise their hands so that they can be identified to make sure that all children are on. Um, and, I'll, and the buddy system really was just to make sure that, um, and we certainly can pull that off if you want, but it's just to make connections so that I know if we're sitting together on the seat that if Ruth isn't there that somebody will say, oh, Ruth isn't here yet or whatever as a, as a reminder or something. But, but you're right, it does do that and um, we could put it in a separate document. We could take that part off. Um, 
whatever the board would like to do as far as that. But we're looking for some standard procedures to make sure that we are always really being accountable for our children. Yeah, the procedure part might want to be at the end of the whole policy thing rather than stuck in under the, what's it called? General okay. standard. Yeah, sure. purpose. And might like in the yeah, my impression would be that the policy would refer to the leader of the trip abiding by the procedures that apply to that grade or age level. It seems to me that our procedure ought to be different for kindergarten students than for our high schoolers. You know, I, I mean, our, our athletes are making multiple bus trips in a season and they get into a routine. I mean, do we really need to spell out that they need buddies and holding hands getting on and off the bus, whereas our kindergartners might need that level of detail. Mm -hmm. So to follow the procedure that's adopted at the level um, or something similar. And maybe it, maybe they will be the same. I, yeah. I'm yeah, sure, sure. not. Yeah, when you say that. That's a good idea. <clears throat> I'm not sure how to do it, but I'll think that um, one through. The, I mean, the, the simple verbal eye-to-eye -eye contact roll call each and every time, whether it's kindergarten or a senior, seems like a foolproof way of, of doing it. Okay. But, still. Yeah. Okay. So, and then I have one other question. Apart from that procedural change, um, and this is a, uh, a topic that I've, I've raised a couple times individually with you, Superintendent Larson, and that is the question of whether this policy as written specifically or expressly calls out in any location that um, field trips are for the students of Brainerd Public Schools, um, and I raise it because I, I do believe that we have had um, in the last five years extren extended trips that have involved students from other school districts, children of chaperones, um, and I I would sense that the board would be surprised to find that the policy has been interpreted to allow that. Um, and I was waiting for an opportunity for this to be updated to raise that as a concern. I, I don't see it. It may, the yeah. MSBA may tell us that it's covered, but I don't know if others of you would be surprised by that, but. But we can make that more clarification in it. You're right. I just, I forgot to do that. So yeah, apologize. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that would be a good clarification to make. It, it, unless ap approved. I mean, I, I assume we could have a process where we're, we're co-oping with another district mm -hmm. for a <coughs> field trip opportunity or something like mm -hmm. that. But in your, your typical field trip that's been approved by the board without that understanding would be okay. a discussion item. Perfect. Yep, great. Anything else you see in it that we should be looking at? Thinking I'm going to make a lot of changes before we meet on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So do we want to table this since there's major changes or do you want to have an approval of a first reading with the changes suggested by the board? Hey. We have three readings, though, don't we? We can, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. You can, you can okay. require so three. Reading. Okay. If you want to do that. Okay. Okay. You comfortable with that approval of this being the first reading with the changes? Well, I think so. I think it allows the discussion at the, at the beginning of the year of this okay. new yeah. procedure that's coming or in development. Sure. Okay, absolutely. Okay. okay. I'll make a motion to approve the first reading of policy six ten uh, with the changes that have been suggested. Second. Okay, so we have a first from Director Nystrom and a second from Director Robinson to approve the first reading of policy 610 with the suggested changes. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And next up, we want to talk about the November school board meeting dates. Superintendent Larson, I think you were going to. I would be happy to. Uh, one of the things that uh, Janet actually brought to my attention is that uh, we're all aware that Veterans Day is on November 11th. And this year, uh, Veterans Day falls on a Sunday. And so Veterans Day is uh, being observed on Monday, November 12th. And so um, the Board of Education has the opportunity that they can still Either, they can either postpone the, their board meeting and have it a, on a different Monday, or you can uh, vote and make that decision that you're going to, uh, that you would continue to have your board meeting on the 12th of November, but you would have to have action to do that. The other thing though, because of the election on November 6th, there, we will have to have a canvassing meeting uh, between November 9th and November 16th. We have 10 days after the election to have a canvassing meeting. And so when um, I met with uh, Chair Nelson and, and Vice Chair Kern, uh, one of the things we talked about is that we thought that we should bring this to the table tonight and have the board decide how you'd like to look at the November meetings, um, set some dates, and so that we give plenty of heads up as far as timing prior to um, that, those changes and we can get it um, communicated to our public. School is in session, though, on the 12th. Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. But there are, there could be veterans' activities that people want to go to in the evening. In the evening, yep. Yep. So. So One of the ideas we had is it would make sense to have a board meeting on the 26th, and then we'd have another one in December two weeks later then we would have to have a um, quick board meeting to canvass the election, probably maybe over lunch or something like that. Mm -hmm. Sometime, some other date. Okay, so we wouldn't meet on the 12th. Right. We'd just have a canvassing meeting. Right. Yep. Okay. We would meet October 22nd. That would be the second meeting in October. And then the 12th is actually three <coughs> Mondays from that so you'd have the opportunity if you wanted on the 5th if if you want otherwise um, we, and then we would have another one on the 26th so it, it's kind of up to the board what you'd like to do I'm sure there's going to be a lot of building stuff coming up um, and and things especially now with uh, some of the going out with the the housing and some of those kinds of things so but if we did the November 5th, November 26th, we'd still have to have a can separate canvas. Yes, yep. What about on the 17th? Or, uh, oh, the 19th. Oh, the 19th. We could do the 19th, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not a good day. <laughs> no, it isn't. But anyway, no, it's fine. It's fine. You want to do the 19th? No, oh, I just I didn't know what. <laughs> what was sacred about that day? <laughs> Why don't we just keep it the 12th? I'm fine with okay. that too. Because we'll almost all the events happen during the day on Veterans Day. Okay. Yeah, there's not many. Okay. Just keep it. Yep. And then uh, do the canvassing at the same time. Yeah. And just oh, have okay. it in one meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's easy. Then we don't need to make a motion. Or yep. Oh, we need to make a motion to have, to declare it a non holiday. Right. To Did we do that at the. Board organizational meeting, though. That's the way I recall it. Yeah, I think we did that already at the mm -hmm. board organizational Perfect. meeting. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So we'll stick with the 12th and we'll have all of those items at that meeting. Great. Okay. Okay, that's all for action and we'll go on to informational. Um, Director Campbell, do you have a Brainerd Public Schools? I do, thank you. Um, the uh, uh, Brainerd Public School Foundation had their annual meeting last Monday. Uh, and they got together and, and just discussed all of the efforts that were done this last year. Uh, and again, the, the funds, assets funds are at 2.1 plus million. Uh, so they're you know, keeping track of all that and doing a wonderful job. Uh, the board said farewell to uh, board members Jill Carlson, 
who's been on the board for nine years, Mike Youngquist uh, for six years, and then outgoing chairman Eric Hapajoki, five years that he put in there. So, so they are all will be leaving the board as of this last meeting. Uh, and then, so if you see any of them, make sure you, you know, thank them again for their years of service and uh, they all do a wonderful job and put in a lot of time there. So, uh, also elected some new uh, uh, the chairmanships for this next year would be uh, Jessica Hapajoki will be the new chair. Vice chair is Patty Honest and treasurer is Katie Hawkinson. And then also we welcome some new board members to replace some of these going off. Uh, Brooke Malik, Jason Wachowicz, and uh, ISD 181 legend Willie Severson joined <laughs> us, so so he's uh, joined the team there now too. So okay. uh, the next thing they're working on is the homecoming run and uh, festivities with with all that activity coming up in October. Okay. It was a great meeting and ready for another year. I'll also they did do uh, evaluation on Jessica and uh, Amber, the director and secretary for the job there, and they all. We're glowing results, so they're doing a wonderful job. And that's all I have. Okay. Curriculum report, Director Martha. I promise to be brief. It's August, not a whole lot of curriculums being written right now. Uh, August 7th and 8th, District Continuous Improvement Retreat occurred here at uh, Washington Educational Services Building. Around 100 teachers and administrators attended. Each site evaluated last year's school improvement work. Then they examined their current and then their historical trend data. And then they made plans for improving student achievement in the coming year. The focus of this work from the district perspective is to continue to focus on multiple consecutive years of high growth for each student in order to close achievement gaps. In order to do that, we're going to continue to refine elements of core instruction around the use or the identification of our priority standards and the use of common formative assessments, and also to refine our systems of student support at each school and each grade level. We're going to introduce staff development around social emotional learning to help students access the learning opportunities that we're creating for them. And then we're also going to work on improving our capacity to use instructional technologies. So those four things constitute the elements of the plan to have consecutive years of high growth for our students. Next step in the process is August 28th. It'll be the site data presentations where staff at each site will review the work that their improvement team has done and share it out with their entire staff and make any modifications that need to be made. Finalized plans will be presented to the board in either September or October. I'll look at your agendas and see which one's longer and try to avoid that because uh, there are multiple site plans to share out with you. It's not a small document as you remember. The data that's being used uh, for the planning is currently embargoed data, so I can't share with you at the moment what the details of the plans are. Uh, by the end of the month, 30th of August, the data becomes public for all, at which point then I can answer any questions publicly you have. If you do have questions about data or plans, you feel free to reach me in my office. And that's pretty much where we're at for right now. We'll be gearing up for the uh, teacher trainings uh, starting later this week. Thank you. And Marcy Lord with the Business Services Report. So I've been working on the financial report. You hopefully will see that at this next meeting. Um, on that report, there'll be year-to-date expenses, the current, the previous month's expenses, excuse me, versus budget. If there's anything else you'd like to see on that report, please let me know, send me an email so that I know what else I should be adding. Um, another document that Lane had brought up um, that will be attached to that report is student count. So it will have last year's enrollment, what's in the budget as of um, the preliminary budget, and then also each month's student count will be updated. So um, that's to come. And then also next month will be the levy. So that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Great. Um, as we talked about, there have been a lot of meetings regarding the buildings that have been going on. And last week, we had just a really fun opportunity to 
close to the core meetings, and Chris talked about it a little bit, but um, I would say, um, Sue, you were at all of them, and Bob, you uh, attended one of them. Um, I would say that there were probably 20 to 25 community people who came to the swimming pool, the one on the swimming pool and the health and wellness. And I would say it was closer to maybe 35 people that came to the performing arts and to the career and technical education committees. And so it really is a community partnership um, as we move forward and look at all of these opportunities that are occurring, primarily in the Brainerd High School facility, but um, it, you know, it definitely impacts our entire district. A couple of things came up, though, that were re really interesting. Um, like we said, we're going to be going to several different school districts to uh, look at swimming pool facilities and health and wellness facilities on the 21st of August. And then we're going to be doing the same thing on the 23rd, uh, going to performing arts centers. And it was really interesting some of the things that um, people were bringing up on our post-it note activities as far as things to not forget because they're really uh, pieces of a performing arts situation that I would have no idea. And um, it's really been exciting because Witsa Smith Nolting has brought in specialists, uh, people who are experts for swimming pools and health and will wellness facilities and in the performing arts. And so that was uh, really exciting to have those people there and to give input and to hear from our public. We did that post-it note activity again about things that we mustn't forget as we move forward. And uh, Carla Sand pulled all of that information together in a document so that we know what questions we want to ask when we go on the tours and what things we don't want to forget as we're in the design phase of those facilities. One of them that I thought was really interesting um, had to do with the career and technical education and the workforce development that we talked a lot about uh, when we were out doing the campaign for the facilities, but also um, our chamber was really um, found that to be just such an important piece. And um, the, the input that we had from people was phenomenal. Uh, one of the people that came to the meeting, um, talked. we talked a lot about how do we know for our career and technical education uh, instructors in the school, who are some of, or what businesses or civic organizations are there in our public or in our surrounding area that are, of, that are available to be advisory to each of their curriculum areas? Who are the contact people at each of those facilities and or within those groups? Um, what are some of the contact information pieces that we should pull together? And one of the uh, people said, this is so important to the future of our school district and to our community and living up to that promise that we shared. They said, could you please, um, you know, like hire someone or find somebody that could definitely put their emphasis in this area to pull this document together for the school district so that we have that step moving forward. Um, that being said, one of the things that I really thought about is um, who do we have on staff that, that we could ask to do this? Um, uh, opportunity and one of the things that I did on Friday is um, Dave Frank came to my mind and we we were going to have him at Forest View but I really felt that you know this is something that is just right up exactly what he is knows all about he knows all of the staff in the career and technical education both at Forest View and at the high school he has um, been in our community for many many years very uh, knows the business community, has great partnerships already set up with the chamber to help develop that document. And visited with him on Friday and he was just very excited about the opportunity of doing this for the school district and trying to get this document finished before he's done at the end of October. Um, this morning, Tim Murtha and Andrea and I met to talk about what are each of the steps that we need to get this document developed so that we can pull together some of the advisory committees in each of the career and technical education areas and to help set up some of the meetings moving forward to start building those partnerships with our business community. And um, we're really excited, so there's a little bit of a change tonight. 
but um, we just really feel that we've got the perfect person right on staff right there, and we really felt that this was going to be a great opportunity. And so um, I, I changed his uh, role uh, for the remainder of uh, while he's here until October 26th. And so we're very excited about this. He thinks that he can get this done uh, before he leaves. He's going to jump on the bus with us when we go um, on the career and technical visits and get some more information, and he's going to help um, to lead that charge with our career and technical uh, education in the district. So very excited about that. So any questions that you have about that? It was very, it was really fun um, to, to have that happen. Um, just a couple other things. One, the school board election is still open until tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Uh, right now we have uh, five candidates that have signed up for the three positions. And, or, no, it's six, isn't it? Six mm -hmm. candidates that have uh, come and submitted their applications to run for the Board of Education. And it, is, it closes tomorrow at 5 o'clock. And then the last thing that I want to talk about in the uh, agenda talks a, a lot of, about some important dates. But there's two dates that I would like to really um, remind the board about. And one is that next Monday, there's going to be the new teacher orientation on, at 8 o'clock at Forest View Middle School. If the Board of Education is available, I'd love to have you um, come to Forest View because uh, when I do my little speech on um, our theme this year is hash, hashtag be Brainerd. And so we're going to do a lot about being Brainerd this year. And then the following Monday on the 27th at 845 will be the all staff welcome back. Um, that's always such a fun one because there's just about a thousand people in, in Tornstrom Auditorium and uh, we're going to have a really nice uh, kickoff this year that's going to be a lot about appreciation for the many gifts that we've been given uh, by our community and in our district. And so really excited about um, where that is all going. It's a great team of people that are working on both of those uh, events, and I think they're going to be really special this year. So I invite the board to come and attend whichever ones of those that you are free to attend. So that's my report. Otherwise, we've talked about everything tonight. So. Okay, so there are no standing committee reports. Um, future board and committee meetings, um, Superintendent Larson mentioned the first two. Our next regular school board meeting is August 27th. First day of school is September 4th. It's coming up quick. Regular, another regular school board meeting on the 10th. Election day is this November 6th. Um, and the MREA conference is at Craigans on November 11th through 13th. Um, now, if there's no other business, um, we need to go into closed meeting pursuant to Minnesota State Statutes Section 13D.05, Subdivision 3A for evaluation of Superintendent Larson. And I'll need a motion for that. I just want to make, make okay. one more mention. I'm uh, proud of us hosting uh, down at Torrance from Missouri Musical Festival oh. again this year. Um, you know, if you haven't been there, you should try to get to one of the events. Especially if you haven't seen a ballet or a the a opera, opera is, the opera is this weekend. Bob was there the other day too. I don't yeah. know if anyone else has it's, joined. But, yeah, it's uh, wonderful. And can't wait to see them perform in the new auditorium in yeah. three, four years or whatever. Tenth year they just celebrating this year. So, okay. thank you for bringing that up. Move we'll to go into closed session. Thank you, Second. Director Hagelin. Thank you, Director Nystrom. So a first from Director Hagelin, a second from Director Nystrom to move into closed session. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay, so we will now move into closed session at 8 o'clock. <laughs>